Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started with our webinar this afternoon in just a few short moments. Um, as folks are flowing into the room, though, we are going to invite you to introduce yourselves on the chat, um, say hello, and we'll we'll be getting started in just a few moments. And welcome everyone, if you're just joining us. We're excited about our webinar this afternoon. We're gonna be talking about affordable housing solutions that actually work. Um, and so we're, we're excited to hear from the group of experts that we have here with us today. My name is Liz and I'm gonna run through just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first off, once again, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate um, you dedicating the time to this topic this afternoon. We do have an hour together and we are reserving 15 or so of those minutes um, for audience Q&A. Um, so we do ask that you um, ask your questions throughout the webinar. You can type them into the chat box. You can use the Q&A feature. We've got a team on the back end who's monitoring that conversation and we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, next thing I'll mention is that this webinar is being recorded, so you will have an opportunity to share it with your networks afterward. So with that said, let's get started. I'm going to hand things over to our host for today's conversation, Mary Griffin. Mary is Executive Director of the Cooperative Development Foundation, and she's the architect behind the Foundation's Affordable Housing Initiative. Mary, take it away. Thanks, Liz, and welcome, everyone. Um, Hope you're having a nice afternoon, morning, wherever you might be. Uh, as Liz just mentioned, I'm executive director with the Cooperative Development Foundation, which for folks who don't know, we were established in 1944 and we're a national nonprofit with a mission to promote and develop cooperatives to improve economic opportunities for all. Through our funds, fiscal sponsorships and fundraising, we make grants and loans that foster cooperative development domestically and abroad across all sectors, including affordable housing, care needs of seniors, and food security. In response to a growing interest in shared ownership models as helpful solutions to our housing crisis that we're experiencing in this country right now, CDF launched earlier this year an affordable housing initiative. The goal of the initiative is to educate communities and decision makers about opportunities for resident and or community owned housing that can help provide not only permanently affordable housing, but also advance racial equity, civic engagement, health and financial well-being, and other community-defined goals. As part of a series of webinars, today we are discussing community land trusts and limited equity or affordable housing cooperatives and how they work together. First, we will hear brief presentations from our three speakers, and then we'll move into a moderated discussion. And as Liz just mentioned, we'll be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with the audience. So please welcome our speakers. Um, first, we have Chul Gugic, for, who's Principal Policy and Legislative Research and Applications with Vassar Development Consultants. He has 15 years of experience in affordable housing development and community building, most recently at Abode Communities, where he worked as acquisition manager on LIHTC and other development projects throughout the state. And prior to that, as project manager at a community of friends, a Los Angeles based organization focused on assisting those experiencing homelessness and living with mental illness. Before coming to Los Angeles in 2016, he spent nearly a decade in New York City as project director of new cooperative development at the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board, or UHAB, which is a multidisciplinary nonprofit specializing in limited equity, housing cooperatives, and community land trusts. Next, is Adam Maloon, Director of Stewardship at the Douglas Community Land Trust in Washington, D.C. Adam serves as, uh, as I said, Director, and earlier he served as Vice President of the Affordable Housing at City First Homes, where the Douglas Community Land Trust was incubated. And prior to CFA, CFH, Adam worked as an attorney at Bay Area Legal Aid in San Francisco where he represented residents and resident associations in efforts to preserve affordable housing developments and worked with community land trusts throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. And third, we have Roberto Carlos Garcia Ceballos. He's co-director of the Fide Comiso Comunitario Tierra Libre, or FCTL. He is a community cultural organizer and strategist based in Los Angeles, Tongva land, 
He was born in Mexico City and raised in San Jose, California. He has co-founded two community-based organizations, FCTL and Community Power Collective, that collectively build collective land stewardship, engage in community power building, and cultural vitality. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joel. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you all. Look, just looking at folks introducing themselves in the chat, and it's really cool to see the breadth of uh, experience and regions that everyone's coming from today. Um, so we wanted to start um, with kind of some level setting and some definitions of common terms that you're going to hear throughout the presentation today. And um, you know, for folks who aren't totally familiar with these community-based ownership models that we'll be talking about, hopefully this slide is, is helpful to you. Um, so yeah, again, this conversation is centered around community-based ownership structures of both land and housing and how direct participation by community members and mission aligned partners can create opportunities to provide for a wide range of a community's needs. So let's start first with some high level definitions of, uh, of again, the common terms that we'll be using. Um, so com a community ownership here at the top refers to entities or properties in which residents and community members lead in both governance and ownership. And the two examples of those we'll be touching on most heavily today are community land trusts, which are nonprofit organizations whose primary mission is to develop and steward land and properties for the benefit of lower income community members and limited equity cooperatives or LECs, which are uh, which is legally designated affordable housing collectively owned and operated by its residents, um, sometimes referred to as shareholders uh, who commit to reselling their units under a limited equity formula. So in other words, um, LECs have uh, regulated caps on how much you can resell your uh, housing shares for. So again, our conversation will focus primarily on CLTs and LECs today, um, but uh, we wanted to include the, the cartoon there on the left here just to illustrate that um, buildings that are located or constructed on top of community land trust aren't limited to just housing. Um, they can include other community serving uses like essential services, retail, public parks, and community gardens. Next slide. So how do CLTs and LACs work together? So in ideal cases, they work together with shared common goals and under a wide range of housing typologies and ownership structures, which we'll start to unpack on the following slides. Uh, but from a high level, there are a number of benefits to community-based ownership structures, including, including maintaining housing affordability. So in a typical CLT, or in a typical structure, a CLT entity may own the land and an LAC, LAC entity may own the housing, both with a shared purpose of maintaining affordability and perpetuity. And under this arrangement, there are two guardrails that kind of protect the long-term affordability of the housing. One is the type of housing itself, which is usually governed by a legally enforceable regulatory agreement that's recorded against the property. And that regulatory agreement restricts the housing units to low-income residents. And then the other guardrail is the CLT um, charter or bylaws, which restrict the use of the land specifically to affordable housing, or again, in other, in, in other contexts to different community serving uses. Um, and there are many benefits to this type of arrangement, um, but just a couple include um, community governance and participation where community members are involved in decision-making processes. Both the CLT and LAC entities are governed by boards of directors, which make all of the key decisions regarding the use and the upkeep of the land and the housing. And another benefit is advocacy and resource sharing between the CLT and LAC board members um, and, and the folks who live who, uh, who live in the housing. So these can be shared skill sets um, and shared networks between the two uh, boards, including technical expertise and coalition building, which can often result in powerful political and legislative outcomes. Next slide. So the next few slides um, are examples of actual CLT and LAC projects where the two have successfully been combined into uh, cohesive housing models under government sponsored programs. Um, and some of these are just meant to illustrate the breadth of what's possible in terms of the housing typology and the land use and the strategic partnerships that can be formed between CLTs and LECs. Um, and they're all kind of meant to apply principles of land and housing decommodification, which is kind of what all this is moving us toward. So this first slide is of a project called the Ridgewood Bushwick project. This is a 17 building, 89 unit scattered site LEC which will sit on top of a community land trust. Um, it's located in Brooklyn, New York in an area that 
um, has undergone a, a very dramatic period of gentrification and it's being developed under a joint venture between two community developed two, two community development corporations based in New York, the Urban Homestead and Assistance Board, where I used to work, and Riseboro Community Partnership, which is a Brooklyn-based organization. Um, these properties, which are nearly fully occupied, were formerly distressed HUD buildings. So these were federal buildings um, and underwent a full uh, a set of full gut renovations. Um, the restricted affordability levels here are up to 80% of household area median income, although the majority of the in-place households were actually much lower than that. Under the City of New York sponsored co-op conversion program, all extremely low income households, so those are households at 30% of AMI and below, are guaranteed a tenant-based Section 8 voucher, which allows the LEC to realize more income to help pay for operational expenses. And the two kind of uh, very remarkable things about this project are that it's, be, that it's being funded wholly with state and federal grants. Um, so there is no conventional mortgage debt on, sadly in this project, which, which allows the um, LEC to maintain uh, a very low affordability. And the share price for legacy tenants, um, meaning the leaseholders who were there when the properties first entered the co-op program is a mere $250. Next slide. And this project, um, Roland Curtis Gardens, um, is actually not a limited equity co-op, but I thought it was useful to include here as an example of how kind of a more conventional type of affordable housing project can be partnered with a community land trust to achieve affordability outcomes in a different context. So Roland Curtis uh, is a new construction, 140 unit transit oriented development project, um, conventionally financed with low income housing tax credits or LIHTC. Uh, which is currently how the majority of affordable rental housing in the U.S. is developed. Uh, the development partnership here was between Abode Communities, uh, which is an established nonprofit developer based in Los Angeles, and Trust South LA, which is a small community-based organization that operates a community land trust um, in South LA. And the history of this project is probably the most important thing to note because it kind of illustrates how, um, a, you know, community-based organization land trust can can um, partner and work uh, effectively with a kind of more traditional developer of affordable housing. So this land um, where Roland Curtis is, was built was previously developed with um, very old aging, low scale, affordable multifamily housing that was fully occupied by low income residents. And the land was, was actually purchased um, after the affordability covenant on those units expired. And it was bought by one of the largest market rate developers um, uh, in, in Los Angeles. Um, and as the site, the site, as you can see, is, is right next to a metro rail line and within a few blocks of the University of Southern California. So from, um, so it was an incredibly valuable, valuable piece of property from a redevelopment standpoint and, and very appealing to this market rate developer who purchased it. So the developer bought the property uh, with the intention of redeveloping it into market rate housing. Uh, but under the guidance of Trust South LA, the tenants organized themselves and eventually forced the developer to sell the property and then formed a development partnership with Abode Communities, which then in turn developed it into 100% affordable housing with communities serving retail and a federally qualified health center, which you can kind of see um, in the photo there sitting right behind the light rail um, in the middle of the photo. Um, probably the most important thing to note you know, other than the, the massive increase in density and, and the, the creation of new affordable units was the 48 original low income households that were threatened with displacement by the market rate developer all retained right of first return and most are now still permanently housed in the new units. Next slide. Um, and then also in Los Angeles, um, we just wanted to highlight um, kind of a recent programmatic development in LA County um, that formed, uh, um, that provided funding to a network of five local community land trusts um, that also um, are, are focused on development of limited equity co-ops. So within the last four and a half years or so, um, the County of LA provided uh, $14 million in um, public pilot funds to the LA County CLT Partnership Program. Um, and the history of this program includes a very deep level of advocacy and engagement from a network of five CLT coalition members, um, all operational within, within LA County, and then also in partnership with a large group of mission aligned housing advocates, um, which formed a proactive, uh, this group formed a proactive response to um, increases in speculative real estate investment in low income communities in LA. 
So the partnership program, um, which ultimately was voted into existence by the county's board of supervisors, dedicated $14 million for the acquisition and rehabilitation of small multifamily properties, which were currently unsubsidized, but affordable housing, or sometimes referred to as Cuba, um, which, is, which essentially means, um, or refers to housing that is unregu unregulated and therefore considered market rate, but with in-place rents that are affordable to low-income households. So ultimately, the CLT coalition collectively acquired 11 separate properties, totally in 43 units, um, and through the program restrictions, preserved affordability in those units, um, which had an average area median income of 49%. And the plan eventually for these properties is to convert them into limited equity housing cooperatives. Currently, they are deed restrict, considered deed restricted rental affordable housing. Uh, but again, the five CLT coalition um, members who acquire these properties are working on converting those units into LECs. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, just a sh shameless uh, self-promotion here. Uh, we wanted to include a slide um, with a QR code that will direct you to a link um, where you can read a report on this program. So um, if folks are interested, go ahead and scan that QR code. Um, and uh, the, the report here gets more into kind of the summary of the, the programmatic history of the LA County pilot program, the outcomes. Um, and we also make some recommendations on how to expand and scale up the program here in LA. Um, and you're going to hear more about um, this from Roberto later on in the presentation, um, as, as he's one of the members of the five member CLT coalition. Uh, so that does it for me, and I'm going to hand it off to Adam. Hello, everybody. Thank you again for coming out this afternoon. Um, uh, so I'm Adam Maloon. I'm the director of stewardship at the Douglas Community Land Trust. We're a uh, 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 Nonprofit organization uh, centered on racial and economic equity. Um, so we are we are set up in the traditional um, community land trust model. So we have a tripartite board. So that's um, one third of the board is reserved for lessees, uh, lessee members. So that would be people that live, work, or have another affiliate. Uh, live or work on uh, CLT property. Um, general members who live, work, or are um, connected to uh, DC, which is our service area, in some some way, you know, um, recognizing that folks have been displaced and they deserve to come back to um, live closer to the the community that they're um, they've created and um, are a, a big part of. Um, and then the third is for public representatives. So these are folks that have relevant um, technical uh, expertise and who we fully intend to put to work using that expertise. Um, for the purpose of the CLT. Um, and these are all voted in by uh, a membership. So we are, I, um, I, I really endorse the traditional CLT model um, as it, it has like a really great uh, basis in the community. Uh, next slide, please. So um, folks always want to know uh, how to get properties into CLTs, all right? Um, so uh, our, our portfolio includes, I like to say just about one of everything. Um, which makes operations, um, we'll, we'll say, uh, interesting, um, engaging, uh, never a dull moment. Um, so we run the run the range from rental, including LIHTC, um, uh, limited equity co-ops, condos, individual condos, and some single family homes um, with a, um, a variety of types within those tenure types. Um, so uh, ways uh, you can get uh, properties into uh, the land trust. And I'll, I'll remind everybody that, you know, the traditional model is uh, improvements or buildings sitting uh, owned by the, the operator or resident um, and sitting on top of uh, CLT land that is then leased back to them. And includes the restrictions that we all um, hold very dear and are the, you know, the purpose of why we are doing these things, right? Um, so, to put those those uh, properties uh, or these these uses on top of CLT land, um, I encourage everybody to be opportunistic, right? Like we, I don't know, uh, I know a handful of massive CLTs, right? Um, and so the rest of us really need to be flexible in how we acquire properties. Um, and you know, so the, this is the list, right, of of different ways to bring it in. So look for your cities or municipalities. Um, NOFA's uh, proposals that come come in, um, even if even if you don't have um, cash to lend, um, make sure you know the points 
um, and how these uh, NOFAs are allocated, right? Who, how they're how the winners are selected, because a lot of times um, that includes uh, permanent affordability and developers, especially of ownership units, um, they are out after they sell everything, and they um, they they like having partners that have experience selling uh, shared equity properties. Um, for example, the Housing Land Trust of Sonoma County. Um, just gets handed keys by developers for their IZ program. Um, and they're the ones that that go go about the, the sale process, finding qualified buyers to get into the homes. And the developers actually really appreciate that because they don't they don't have to um, work in an area that they're a little bit unfamiliar with. Um, so be aware you can join a partnership team without necessarily having to put cash in. Um, you know, if if a, if a, an, another nonprofit is changing their kind of focus, um, you can have them assigned uh, in DC with the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. And I know a number of other municipalities are looking at this too. I think Berkeley recently uh, passed or is adopting something similar, um, which is which is great. Um, uh, you don't have to necessarily find a willing uh, landlord to sell the properties if the if the residents are interested in putting it into a, a land trust. Um, there's charitable or bargain sales. IZ, as I mentioned before, and then uh, for those CLTs that are also serving as a developer, you know, you guys are you guys are are developing it yourselves and bringing it in that way. Uh, next slide, please. So um, keys to success for LECs in in a in a CLT um, or LECs generally, like these are not this is not rocket surgery, right? Um, so it starts off with how they're the foundation that they come with. Uh, is the acquisition well planned? And if it, if you know whether or not it was planned the best back when it was acquired, can you improve on the governing documents and the the budgets? Right. So how how are they going? Are these sustainable? Um, budgets definitely have to be checked in on after after a couple of years as prices kind of uh, fluctuate. And you know we all know that most of the residents they have a fixed or very slowly growing income, so need to be need to keep an eye on that. Um, committed residents, both as members and uh, general members of the co-op and board members. Um, the more committed they are, the easier everyone's job is. And, um, you know, the faster you can get done and the more kind of wide ranging activities you can include. Um, and then the last bit is, uh, you know, the long term stewardship or technical assistance. And we'll we'll go into that in the next slide. So um, I'll remind everybody that um, operating a, a multifamily housing is is a business, right? There are landlords that do this, um, or you know, management companies at least that do this for for a living. Um, and you have to you have to maintain the physical, financial, and legal aspects of these of these businesses of these of these properties, right? Um, and underlying all that, you know, that's that's in the the market rate context. Those needs don't substantially change when in a LEC um, environment. So uh, uh, limited equity co-ops have all those same needs. Um, and then I, I encourage you to think about, you know, what what kind of team a for-profit venture has and what kind of kind of team a LEC has, right? So we often kind of end up putting these folks in the position of running a multi-million dollar business in their spare time, right? These are low-income folks. I have a lot of work and family commitments. Um, and so the remaining time to do the things necessary to maintain their building and maintain their home, um, it is, they have to budget that really, really carefully. Um, so having a, a partner that has, that can take on this long-term planning, that can backstop everything, that has, uh, serves as an information repository, both institutional and actual document retention is, is, can be a, a, an issue, especially with the older CLT, uh, LECs, um, and making sure that just that everybody's um, communicating um, and meeting the deadlines that that the LECs need to meet as as businesses and as you know housing providers. Next slide, please. And you know what does what does this partnership look like, right? I think I think LECs and CLTs are terrific together because you have a built in steward or technical assistance provider just committed from go um, you can you can build in uh, uh, payment for that that ta through land lease structures if you're in part of the development make sure to you know you can build that in so you can cover cost 
uh, staffing costs that um, can be pretty significant sometimes depending on the the, the rest of the team. Um, so LACs, you know, you put money in initially, you are providing subsidy and, and a 99 year commitment. And as part of that, right, there's also that normative connection to, to the building and to the people and they, they recognize that. Um, compliance is a huge part of this and something that is really difficult to get folks to do. Um, board members do not like being the bad guy and having a teammate, a team member who's willing to be the one to um, push the board and the members to take unpopular positions, such as increasing carrying charges by 2% a year, right? Like that is often needed to cover costs, but that is a huge diff a huge amount or a substantial enough amount for some folks that really impacts their family budgets. So being aware of that um, and really pushing the board to do what they need to preserve all the housing in general. Um, you know, uh, having having a support network for these board members, right? Like you will have the same folks over and over again. It's it's important to build depth within the the co-op and and provide a a support network, um, both other you know co-op leaders um, as well as uh, third parties that you can refer to them. You know, as you find competent people, hold them close. And I see I I've worked with a number of people here on the call. I'm glad to see y'all uh, tuning in. Um, and you know, hold those competent people close um, and treat them well so you can keep them as part of the team and as, as part of um, the, the LEC kind of uh, uh, task force. Um, and then I really don't, I, I can't overstate how, how helpful social events are. It is, you know, a little bit harder to, to show uh, KPIs um, when doing this, but I will tell you, I've I've found out the most about people who are breaking uh, covenants, trying to rent out their units, not by you know traditional kind of check-ins, but by gossip that I have talking over you know popcorn or or ice cream cones. Um, people warm up to you and they share stuff, and that is very very relevant um, as they kind of get to know you um, and things like that. And and it also provides an opportunity to address the material needs of your members, right? And to, to offset maybe the 2% increase in carrying charges by signing them up for an energy savings program, right? And work with your agencies because uh, we've at least been able to negotiate um, an exemption for income certification for some of these uh, programs because they've already been income certified. Um, and all they have to do is like sign a couple documents and they're, they're set up for like ongoing uh, utility um, payments, which is which is really great and really frees up their capacity and shows the connection of how a CLT can help them and the LEC. Um, lots more to discuss. Happy to address them in the Q and A section. And um, without further ado, I'll hand it off to my colleague R Roberto. Hey everyone, uh, I'm going to be talking about the organizing aspect um, of acquiring a building through a CLT. Um, and I'm specifically going to be using uh, a case study uh, that involved what you uh, shared earlier around uh, the CLT pilot program in the county of LA. Uh, so I'm uh, the co-director of Fidecomiso Comunitario Tierra Libre. We're a five-year-old community land trust in Boyle Heights in East LA. Um, we were actually incubated in an affordable housing uh, developer that's local to the east side. Um, and it was really um, to expand the tools um, and the way we developed affordable housing in the neighborhood in ways that it was more engaging with our membership. Uh, it gave more decision making to the organizing bodies that we were working with. And at the same time, it, um, we felt like uh, there, there needed to be a shift in affordable housing. And in the way it like community members uh, are part of the development um, of, of not just like housing, but uh, like how folks control their neighborhood. And so we founded a community land trust five years ago. It was incubated at the East LA Community Corporation. And now um, for the past three years, we've been an independent 501c3. Um, and uh, part of our growing process has been learning to uh, organize tenants. Um, and, and build the right partnerships um, here in the city of LA. And so if uh, we could go to the next slide. 
I just uh, skip one. Ah, there you go. So I think for us, one of the biggest learnings uh, has been just working in organizing tenants. Um, and so for us, it's just really important uh, to do outreach, like for us, finding ways to connect with tenants and people directly impacted by the housing crisis and having them become leaders in our organization is really important. And so the first step is finding them. And so during the pandemic, um, you know, it was, it was actually when we became an independent organization. And one of the things that we realized is that we needed to just jump into direct services. At, the, at that time, uh, we did a lot of food distribution uh, we were we looked for grants to be able to uh, help people cover the rent or any other expenses. But then one specific thing that we saw and over and over again was the selling of buildings in the midst of the pandemic in there. And for us, it was a really uncomfortable and gross experience to see uh, the transactions that were happening and the immediate kind of uh, displacement that uh, the new owners were attempting on the previous tenants. And so for us, it was really important to figure out what buildings were being sold um, in our neighborhood. And so we went to our uh, allied brokers and asked for lists of buildings that were being so, uh, sold. And then we, um, or, or, or pre-foreclosed or, um, or foreclosed on. And uh, we went and started door knocking um, at, at these folks' uh, doors and really, uh, the first kind of immediate thing was like for them to be able to receive resources specifically around knowing their rights um, and then inviting them to join our, our uh, biweekly meetings um, to learn more about the situation that was happening in the building. And because a lot of folks were experiencing, uh, you know, immediate, um, you know, illegal uh, evictions that were happening. And so at the, at then, we, that's where we really kind of, in these meeting spaces, uh, really talk to them about forming tenant associations in their buildings. Um, we create a space that directly communicates uh, to them. And so we have a bilingual tenant meeting that's ran in Spanish and it's um, facilitated in Spanish and the interpretation is done in English for, for English speakers. Um, and we really try to keep it like oriented to, to the community. And there's been moments where we've had to do direct action. And so like the actually the introduction of my presentation is actually a picture of a family that we help win uh, in immediate eviction where uh, folks in the community were ready to uh, put their, to do like civil disobedience of not letting these families get evicted. Luckily we were able to stop the eviction at the, um, um, at the courts. But you know, it's 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 like that, like sort of direct, immediate response to what folks are experiencing. Um, and then we have, and then most importantly, we have capacity building. And so we train tenants um, around alternative models. Uh, we talk, we we have folks join our membership. So our CLT is a membership organization where folks uh, pay twenty five dollars to be a member or do twelve hours of volunteer work. Um, and we really train them to be organizers in the community. We train them to be stewards of land. Um, and specifically, um, we, we are actually building the capacity to train them to assess uh, the ability to buy their buildings as, uh, as a tenant association. And so we do this work specifically because uh, we learned a lot um, in the last three years. And specifically, one of the things we learned from is uh, acquiring a building. Um, and so, if we could go to the next slide. So uh, Fideicomiso Comunitario Tierra Libre uh, is part of uh, the, the LA uh, CLT, the, <clears throat> sorry, the LA CLT coalition. Um, it's, a, or it's a coalition of five organizations that are in uh, relationship to each other um, and that we're actually building infrastructure. So we don't, we're not just a coalition that works on policy, or campaigns, but we actually try to build out the infrastructure that's needed in our neighborhoods uh, throughout the city and the county of LA. And so for us, it's really important for us to fundraise together, to share resources, to learn from each other's acquisitions and developments. Um, and so we have a, an a, a array of uh, actual infrastructure um, where we're consistently assessing policy, assessing our uh, shared practices of development, 
um, and um, and really thinking of like what else is needed. And so uh, one of the things that we worked on was the CLT pilot program where we were able to win $14 million from the County of LA. Um, and while, while we were working at that level of coalition on the ground, Fidecomiso and uh, Community Power Collective, which is another organization and Little Tokyo Service Center were working on actually thinking through of the acquisition of buildings. Um, like I said, it, it was um, a horrible thing to see in our neighborhoods where we're in the middle of a uh, of the pandemic and buildings were being flipped. Um, buildings were, uh, we there was there is still aggressive uh, owners that are corporate uh, uh, owners as well that are aggressively trying to evict and like re uh, gentrify our neighborhood. And so for us, we had to come up with a strategy. And, and so that's where we came up with the door knocking strategy. And so while we were working on winning the $14 million, we were out door knocking. Um, and so uh, as uh, folks being on the ground, we were able to identify the Simmons building as our first acquisition. Um, and so we bought it um, with less than, um, a little bit less than $2 million. Um, but, you know, while we were purchased, like while Little Tokyo Service Center and Fidecomiso we're working on the closing and buying of the building. Uh, Fidecomiso and Community Power Collective, which is another community-based organization here in Boyle Heights, was working on uh, building relationships with the tenants. Um, so this is like uh, between January and April, and by May, we're, uh, we acquired the building. Um, and then um, we immediately uh, put together uh, a, a meeting with the tenants and introduce ourselves as uh, the body organizations and uh, and really kind of share with them our, our aspirations of really stabilizing the building with them um, and long-term figuring out a stewardship or a collective ownership model where we would work with them. Uh, by June, uh, we have community events, uh, we bring cultural workers in to work with us. We have block parties, summertime. Um, and really, it's really like really trying to build that relationship that is needed with the tenants. Um, if we go to the next slide. And so between, between last year and this year, we focused on stable, uh, building a stable monthly meeting uh, where all three organizations participate in building relationships and trust with the tenants. We create the space uh, to continue to do more in-depth training around who our organizations are. Um, and then specifically in these meetings, we incorporate our tenants and decision-making around the rehab of the building. Um, and also uh, continue to build awareness. And, and this is a really hard task as, an, as a community land trust or as an affordable housing developer of like being the one who advocates for like, and and pushes them to build tenant association and, and really practice like their tenant rates on us um, as a way of part of what that relationship is. Um, and so um, at the moment, um, yeah, so at the moment from uh, starting, starting this year um, till the current time, uh, we've actually had tenants join our board for the community land trust, which is a really important piece of our uh, decision-making process as an organization. And we're actually, in, uh, we've actually relocated um, some of the tenants uh, temporarily as we're rehabbing the building, which they were all a part of helping us decide on like how the rehab was gonna happen. And then we're also starting to engage uh, like what co-op conversion is. And so we're, we're starting to bring in training we're starting to develop our tenants around uh, really starting to envision themselves as collective owners. Um, and, and so long-term, what's really important is that uh, we wanna see the transition of our partner, our senior partner, which is Little Tokyo Service Center transition out uh, by giving the building, the 100% 100 of the ownership to the building, splitting the land, and then continuing to work with our tenants. And we see that the conversion to um, the ownership model is actually gonna be a longer process. And that for us, like that is the intention. And so for us, we understand that it's, it, it is a long-term process, 
but it's something that we like since the beginning really kind of thought through and wanted to apply. Um, lastly, um, I think a lot of policy was built around this as well in organizing. And so one of the really cool things about the grant agreement for the CLT pilot program is that we incorporated the ability to convert the building into a co-op. Like we have that option in our grant and that we received 100% grant funding where we didn't have to bring in any other subsidy. Um, and that the only subsidy, other additional subsidies that we've had to bring in or uh, financing has been really to complete the rehab, which, um, you know, just a little bit about the Simmons building. It's, uh, it was probably the, the lowest cost uh, per unit, um, but it was the more, it had the most um, deferred maintenance and conditions uh, that any of the other buildings had. And so once we opened the walls and through all the permitting process, um, those expenses went up. And so th those are even conversations we had to have with our tenants um, and really deciding like, what was the scope of work that we were able to accomplish uh, collectively? Um, and so if we could go to the next slide, um, just based, off of, based out of all this like on the ground organizing, uh, and these are, and in the last five years, these are things that we've learned um, and like what type of ongoing support is needed. And I think when I talk about ongoing support, I really think about infrastructure. And so LA County and the city of LA historically hasn't had the infrastructure to build out community land trusts or any form of alternative housing uh, that regarding like housing cooperatives. And so for us, um, these are kind of some of the constant things that are coming up. And then I'll talk about one, so one way that we're trying to address these things. And so the first one is like acquisition rehab program. So we have this pilot program, but prior to that, there wasn't anything at the county or the city of LA. And so for us, it's really difficult to like, like we we're working with tenants, we're supporting tenants, we're stabilizing um, and, and preventing displacement through illegal evictions or attempts to evict uh, tenants and displace tenants. But what's the next step? Like, how are we like long-term gonna stabilize? And how do we then take control of the building from these land, like from these uh, owners and landlords that are uh, have no interest in really stabilizing our community. And so the tenant, like we see that the tenant opportunity to purchase act is one of those opportunities that could really help us. But then we also need a funding source um, regionally to support us. We need regional infrastructure to support tenants and building housing cooperatives and housing alternatives. Um, so we need uh, a, a hub or we need a, a space that really brings the resources of building the legal framework, co-op formation, uh, even conflict resolution and, and, and consolidating the financial products that are available for tenants. Um, and so we like to refer uh, you have New York as one of those like, you know, specific infrastructures that we need here in LA. Uh, not, not them specifically, but like that sort of infrastructure. Um, organizing um, our housing department and moving them to trust alternative housing models so there's so much skeptic skepticism and um, unwillingness to work with uh, CLTs or housing co-ops. And there's this really strong belief that they don't work uh, without any like self-criticism around like not putting in the infrastructure and the legal framework and the policies that are needed uh, for, for these models to, to have flourished in the last, uh, you know, in the last decades. And so we, we want to make sure that there's more that there's the need to like really have that education in the housing department and the county uh, re like development departments. Um, and then the, the last thing is like resources for building the capacity and assets of CLTs and other community ownership organizations. So like, uh, you know, if there's foundations out there, like, you know, these type of organizations need funding for staff, resident capacity building, um, and grant capital to advance like acquisitions and specifically like flexible, low cost um, patient capital tailored to each stage of the CLT acquisition process, but also for the co-op process. Um, and so like in, in Southern California and specifically LA, like there's a desert for, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a financial desert when it comes to the, to the financial uh, products and resources that are needed to really build up this at scale. Um, and so um, just to kind of briefly touch on this, um, you know, uh, I, 
I, I said, what's needed and what are we doing about it? And so last year we passed a ballot measure called Measure ULA through the United to House LA Coalition, which was drafted by homeless service providers, affordable housing, nonprofits, labor unions, and tenant um, organizations. And it's really to raise um, about 800 to a billion dollars a year to be uh, uh, used towards new social housing programs. And what we mean by that is that, <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit of, the, of, of what that looks like, but the way the ballot uh, or the way the policy would work is that anytime there's a real estate uh, sale or transfer of, um, of property uh, that's over $5 million, there would be a 4% tax um, on it. And if it's a property over $10 million, there would be a 5.5% um, tax on it. And this would immediately uh, help us like solve um, like one like like a lot of the issues that I talk about. And the way and the way the revenue is distributed in the ballot is that 70% of the funds would be used towards affordable housing. Of that 70%, 22.5 would be used to alternative for alternative housing models. Um, so affordable housing developments that incorporate housing cooperatives, um, uh, tenant councils, um, just like bodies of decision-making, 22.5% would be used for multifamily affordable housing. 10% would be used for acquisition rehab. So the, the work that I just talked about and 10% uh, of that would be used for home ownership capacity building and operating assistance. And that 10% is really important because that's the capacity building infrastructure that we need that I just talked about where folks are trained, but not just people, but organizations, affordable housing developers, financial institutions are also need, need that education and training and some of our departments. 30% um, uh, of the overall funding would be used for homeless prevention. So short-term rental support, uh, tenant right education and eviction defense. That's also a really important piece. Um, and then the rest would be used uh, for, uh, for admin like costs for the city. And so in a lot of ways, like, you know, I, I mentioned what's needed and then, and we think, and I think like through the U, uh, United to House LA coalition, these are like the response that we have as a community of how we're gonna get the support that we want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. Uh, I think we got a lot of different perspectives and I was going into a moderated discussion, but I think we have so many questions and so much interest. Um, to really frame, if you if you all just heard, there's an amazing thing happening in, in Los Angeles and a lot of it is due to the years of the different organizing that's been going on. So they were prepared as a community land trust, as community building for this new tax that will provide um, an estimated over 500 million a year for affordable housing, at least a third of it specifically earmarked for shared ownership housing. So it's a wonderful opportunity to start moving um, very, very high cost cities into, um, into a situation where they can provide a permanently affordable ownership opportunities to their residents. Um, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with some of the questions we're seeing here because I, I want to make sure we cover it. One is, um, and I don't know if this is for Adam or Chul, but separate from rental income, what are the common sources to fund a CLT's operating reserves? Um, and and Adam, you can maybe ask this: what, Who, how are you funded as as the steward organization? Because I think that's helpful for people to know. Yeah, I I think I think we're right in. Uh... And alignment. I just I was just typing out an answer. I apologize. Um, I I really want to stress um, we don't want to be extractive when we come to uh, earned income. Um, so any any costs that are paid by um, tenants that go beyond the operation of their development, like question what you know, question if if that's something that you really want to get into because then you are you are adding to their cost burden to pay for things. So one you know. Um, do operation and maintenance reserve, I would recommend specific to the developments, um, because that that's also lets uh, folks kind of understand where their money is going to, what it's being used for. Um, but uh, contracts with the city, um, I think Proud Ground up 
uh, is has a real estate brokerage. Um, there's a, a ton of uh, different sources for er earned income, but but really, um, I think city contracts for TA or other uh, activity that you're is in your wheelhouse is is a great way for operations. Okay, great. Um, and another question that came up, which is I think of sort of interesting, is um, someone's talking about they represent a group trying to develop a mixed use mid rise senior housing co op with extended services. Uh, within an equitable transit oriented development. And they exist as two entities, a 501c3 nonprofit that plans to hold the pr property and provide the space for and management, and an LEC that will provide affordable housing. They had gone to a local CLT hoping to find synergies and a possible collaboration. Their representative, an attorney, advised them that it would hinder them to combine the two approaches. Um, she said everything that the LEC and the nonprofit could do everything the LCLT route would do through their own nonprofit. This is a great, a great issue, I'm sure, in many, in in many instances. So, um, Chul, I'm, I'll maybe hand that over to you. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, in my opinion, a CLT is not always, you know, I think the 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 representative is correct. A CLT entity as the owner and steward of the land is not always necessary um, to have. So long as the owner of the land is kind of mission aligned with the, the uses that sit on the land. So whether that's a LEC or you know mixed use project or what, or what have you. In this instance, given the land owner is a 501c3, presumably with a kind of mission aligned focus, um, you know, it may be less strenuous to just kind of keep that structure in place um, rather than um, layering into um, the project a CLT, which comes with its own kind of governance, you know, for lack of a better term, bureaucracy. Um, that said, I think there's always benefits to engaging with CLTs just given their kind of breadth of experience and technical capacities that they can help bring to um you know the project redevelopment um but it's not wholly necessary to have them involved in the actual kind of ownership structure of, or development of the project right um and so i can add to that just real quick you can always set it up so that you can um have joined the clt later too right so like you can you can build it out and then you know perhaps they're doing single family and they don't they're not very familiar with multifamily you know, set it up so that you can you can have a partner later on too, as you both grow. Um, another question is it, that I think people are interested in what's what's your knowledge experience financing CLTs with the business section of mixed use properties, and this raises another um, that I don't know we we hit completely on the head, but how do you preserve that affordability? Where is that affordability preserved across all the buildings um, in a CLT? So those are two questions. One is about the business section of mixed-use mixed use properties. And do are they under an affordability um, edict? And then how do you preserve affordability for all the buildings? Who wants to take that? I can try to take it. Um, in terms of the preservation of affordability on the housing units, um, that's facilitated through a legally enforceable um, affordability covenant that's usually placed by a public agency that is a participating financer in the project. So, for example, in the case of um, the Roland or the um, Richard Bushwick project, that that project is funded wholly with public dollars that are accompanied by an affordability covenant. Um, so that kind of takes care of that. And then of course, there's also the, the very critical uh, compliance and enforcement part that you know has to live separate from that to make sure the units are actually rented to low income households or qualifying income qualifying households. And then in terms of what the CLT can bring, I think it, it kind of, you know, it's, it's fairly flexible, but Generally speaking, and Adam should correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the CLT entities generally have a set of bylaws that restrict 
the use of the land. So, um, for example, in a in a structure where you have a CLT that owns the land and an LEC entity that owns the housing improvements, um, the LEC leases the land from the CLT under the terms of a ground lease, which dictate the use of the land in perpetuity for it's usually like a 99 year ground lease term or something that says you can't use this land for anything other than affordable housing or community serving uses or public park or what have you. Yeah, I mean, that's that's right on. The thing I'd add to it is um, uh, covenants are not self-enforcing. Um, so restate everything in that covenant in your land lease. So belt and suspenders. Great, and Roberto, I have a couple of questions um, for you uh, and I'll just give them to you so, because they're more project specific. What percentage of the tenants did not want to participate and what about tenants with zero money? That's one. And then a little bit about the temporary relocation. What legal protections did residents have? Where do they go? And and who funds that uh, that transition while they're in the temporary housing? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, um, so, so, so when we acquired the building, um, we had known the, the tenants for like less than a month. And we really, uh, we really were focused on making sure they knew their rights because we didn't know if we were going to acquire the building. Um, and then the other is just providing direct services that we had at the moment. Um, and so then when we acquired the building, um, there was a, a level of excitement uh, for uh, our organization to take over, specifically because of. <laughs> you know, the Simmons building uh, was in critical condition and it was very appa apparent, it's very apparent um, in terms of when you walk into the units um, and you look at the level of um, neglect that it's had over the years and folks, so so um, there's 100% interest in participating in like decision-making around um, the rehab and um, and getting to know the organization, there's a level of mistrust around <laughs> the the conversion of, of ownership. And I think for folks, it's it's really hard to even imagine that. And it's ongoing training that we do. And so when we start having these conversations around conversion or just learning about co-ops of all sorts, they uh, we have like a 40% drop of participation um, and sometimes more. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, and the one thing that we are really consistent about is that we've always had an organizer at the building um, consistently doing one-on-one -on -one work and working with the families. And a lot of the times when things, when folks start, stop participating is that they're going through some sort of financial burden. Um, so I, uh, I, I didn't mention this, but out of the 11 buildings, um, Simmons has the lowest AMI um, per, um, and so what we're we're talking about is that folks are actually uh, in in uh, you know day by day in terms of their finances or in some and have consistently there's been a pattern of folks not being able to pay rent at times, and so I think when we talk about ownership, I think that has a lot to do of how folks are imagining themselves uh, owning a building <laughs> and it's a and it's a really difficult thing to hold and and I, I think we're doing a pretty good job at it uh, because uh, like I said it's long term and so for us it's most important to really focus on the stabilization of the building and really trying to assess how we really bring services and support and empowerment to uh, our folks and so our first step is folks joining the community land trust. Uh, it's, it's not talking about formation um, because that gets really scary. Um, and so for us, it's more of like, how do you join this land trust? How do we build committees in the building? Um, how, do we, um, how do we decide collectively who's available to be the property manager for the building? Like those are the decision making, like, and then and, and looking and like looking at the budget together and and then slow and then slowly getting them to join the board, and slowly getting them engaged in other aspects of the community land trust. And so for us, that's the that's the work that needs to be done. In, like first, 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think in three or four years, we could revisit the conversation of what does formation look like and what is the model we're gonna use uh, based on having had more practice with the tenants. That's great. That's great to hear. Well, we are uh, one minute over time, and this has been oh, so sorry. great. We debated whether we should have a 90 minute or one hour, and this, you never know, but this one we probably should have nine minutes. But what I want to tell um, the audience is yes, the PowerPoint will be available. Yes, the recording will be available. Yes, you can share. Our whole point is to share and get this knowledge out there. Um, and the other thing we'll do is there's been a number of, of questions, and they're all really good questions. We'll get those put together with the answers. So you have that in terms of the experts. Um, and where do you get support? Will you have some right in front of you? Um, you can check with different groups if you want to go to our cdf.coop um, slash affordable housing initiative. You can, we have a report and you can find the four advisory groups we're working with who are all knowledgeable. Um, there's a lot of help out there uh, and we just invite you to, to seek that assistance and we're here to help. We will have... Um, we're hoping to have another webinar, probably, I don't know in how many months, on financing options, because I think that's also uh, very of very much interest, top, top of the mind. Um, but just want to thank you and um, say, say thank you to our guests and thank you to Joe and Liz um, who helped out. And we wish you a good afternoon and happy housing. <laughs>